Hello everyone, today I will be demonstrating my newest project, Platformer, and wait, have I done this before? Well, let's just jump right into it. Wait, powered by Unity, what is this? Well, as you can guess, today I will be showing the basics of how to port a Cocos 2DX project to Unity. Now, first of all, I'd like to say that if you're thinking of building for Unity, build for Unity. These two frameworks are completely incompatible with each other, so if you ever need to port, you have to change a lot of code. So that's something to keep in mind before you get yourself into this. Um, first, I will show that the game looks and plays pretty much exactly the same. See? The character still jumps when I speak. I did make some adjustments so that his height um, would it would be the game would be easier to play. Uh, the game plays out the same way as it did with the Cocos 2DX project. So now I will show off the code. More specifically, the changes I have made so that the same code will work in Unity. Okay, now before I show the code, I'm going to show how I was able to mimic the Cocos 2DX standard GUI. So, first thing I did here for the background, what I did was I went to the main camera and I changed the background color, which you can see right here. It's the second item on the camera. The second item I have here is script holder. Depending on the scene, it may have different scripts, but all of them have a global script, which I use to handle standard actions like going backwards or quitting the application, etc. Now for the GUI, I'll change to the scene view for a moment. And here is the close item. You can see I anchored it to the bottom right corner so that way, no matter what device it's on, it will always be in that corner. And I just made sure that the width and height are the exact size of the uh, image. And as you may know, the standard is that there's a closed normal and a closed selected. What I did to do this was I changed the transition state to sprite swap. And since this is for a mobile device, highlighted sprite does not really matter, so I just use the same as the source image. And then for pressed, I used the close selected. And for disabled, I didn't really care about, so I left that unassigned. Um, for menu labels, Cocos 2DX always centers on the actual coordinate. So what I did was because all of my items that I positioned were based on the visible size property in Cocos 2DX, what I did was is that I instead used the anchors. Now, originally I spread everything apart equally, so I used five parts. The title was four-fifths of the way up, so I made both Y anchors 0 0.8, which is 80% of the way up, and then I sized the text to exactly fit so that I'd have it perfectly centered. And of course, I center aligned both horizontally and vertically. Finally, I positioned it at 0, 0, so that it's directly at the center pivot. And that is how all the text is done. Menu items are done slightly differently. I first set the font size to the bigger size, which I use font size 33, as you'll see. And then I stretched the size to that. And then I have some events here for on mouse down, on mouse up, and the actual click, which I will show later what those do, but essentially they mimic the way Cocos 2DX makes the text expand when you touch an item. And then the change scene function I have here allows the change of the scenes. And that's pretty much how all of the GUI is handled. Um, you can see no matter which uh, scene I go to, they're all handled the same. This one, you'll notice the items seem to be bunched together. I use the exact size that it would appear on the tablet as the default size. And if it's too big, as you can see here when I play, I have a script where it shrinks the text to fit. Otherwise, it will use the original formatting. And that's also part of the global script, which I'll show later. Now I'm going to show the code. 
Um, first, I'll show the global script. As defaults Cocos 2DX applications, they start as just landscape by default. So I kept it strictly in that orientation by using this assignment here. And then next is my code that does the shrinking of the text objects. It goes through the entire canvas and it sees if the width is greater than the screen width. And it does that by checking the current rectangle. It should be noted that the rectangle property of the element is read only. Don't expect to be able to make changes there. Instead, to change size, if you are not spreading out your anchors, you would use size delta. So that is what I do here. I just make sure that I shrink it to the screen width and I keep the same height. And here are the on button touch and on button release, which sets the font size to make it expand and shrink. Change scene, all it does is take the string and load the particular level. Uh, down here is go back, which is called when you press the back key. If you're not at the main menu, then we are going back to the main menu. Otherwise, we are quitting the application. And I had it as a separate function because one, the close button needs something to call. And two, I did that just in case I needed to release resources. Because in the original application, that is when I released the sound resources, but I do not need to do that here. Next is the recorder. This is the one part of the program that is completely different from the original because that was all handled in Java code with native calls. The microphone is handled differently in Unity. When the buffer is filled, it is filled with actual samples instead of bytes. So I have to handle things a little bit differently. Here I just have an arbitrary clip length of 999 seconds, just have a decent size. I use the same sample rate as before, 44.1 kilohertz. The buffer size I use 735, which I'll have a link later to show where I got this information on how to do it the Unity way and how it shows that buffer size. And this is the conversion. Samples in Unity are arranged from negative one to positive one. So to make the values that pop up in the volume display similar to what I had in Cocos, I use this conversion that I just multiply by. It's not exact, but it's very close. So here, I did not show it, but in the game script holder itself, I also have to attach an audio source component. I start recording on the clip by using the default microphone. That's what the null is for. And I want to record the entire time, so I'm going to loop. That's what true is for. And the length of the buffer is my clip length, and I'm going to use the sample rate I have set. And then I want to create a new float buffer because, as I mentioned, the samples are floats with the buffer size I used. And here's the replace for on pause and on resume. I have on application pause. And if we are pausing, we want to stop recording so that we are not wasting valuable resources. And if we are resuming, I have if source does not equal null because this will also be called when you start the thing. So that way it's not trying to do it when we haven't set our source yet. And then this just starts it up again. And then on every update, we're going to keep getting the current volume. And we do that by determining if we're recording. And then we want to get the mic position. But we want to make sure that how much it's recorded is far enough that it can fill the buffer. Otherwise, if we don't do that, when we calculate the position that we're going to start recording, it could end up being negative if we haven't recorded enough. So that's why I have that check there. So we get the starting position, and we get that data and put it in the buffer. And then since we are using actual samples, I don't need to do a complicated calculation like I did in the original version. So all I'm doing is just taking the samples, adding them into a single value, getting their absolute value first, and then I get the mean by using the buffer size, dividing by two. And then, at, of course, I multiply by my conversion rate, so I get the value I want. Next is the game loop. This is essentially the replacement of the game scenes update. In general, when you are replacing the Coco scenes with these scripts in C++, you would just ignore the header, look at your C++ file, take the Coco's init, replace that with start, then take your update and replace it with the capitalized update. You don't pass in DT like you do in Coco's 2DX because you just use time.tal to time. That's generally what you do and you would just take out from the code the GUI elements and put them in the actual GUI accordingly. Here though I will cover the main differences. I added constants for the number of tiles and the maximum collectibles on the screen. 
here we are initializing the tiles. I have to get the sprite from the sprite renderer. I basically created prefabs in advance for the tiles, the player, and the collectibles. You can see here, in resources I have all my images and the one sound, but this is where the sprites are stored. And these are just game objects. They were created as sprites, then I added a box collider 2D and a rigid body, and of course the scripts as appropriate. Tiles do not need scripts in this case. Before they did because I had a disintegrate function. However, with gameObject.destroy, I can just do that from outside of a class. So I did not need a script in that case. But essentially, that is what is done here. And as you can see, I used fixed angle for the player and the collectible so that they can't turn. With the collectible, I don't think I pointed out, the box collider is set as a trigger. This is essentially the equivalent of I don't want them to collide with each other, so that way the player is unaffected when the collectible moves into the player. It won't cause them to be pushed, essentially. And then the tile is just a box collider because it won't really be moving around, so it doesn't need a rigid body. Back to the code. If you've seen my previous video, you'll notice a lot of this code is the same. The biggest difference is when the tile is created. I do an instantiate and I take my tile prefab and I have to get the coordinates. And what I did was I would use the screen height and or screen width to determine where to put it as well as the size of these sprites. To get the size of these sprites, I would have to get the sprite, get its bounds, the size, and then either X or Y. And now because I want to start at the bottom of the screen, I need to take the screen coordinates and then translate to world points before I use them here. Otherwise, my game object will instantiate in the wrong spot. The 0, 0, I don't really care about the X coordinate, so I just use that instead of creating a new vector 3. All I care about is that it needs to be at the bottom of the screen. So I get the Y coordinate and then I add the height of the tile, which is what I did originally in the old code. And then the rest of the initialization code is the same from C++. Next, I initialize the player. Zero is for the X coordinate because I want him to start in the center. Then I want to start him from the bottom of the screen and then move him up to be on top of the first tile. So I take the bottom of the screen, translate it to a world point again, and then add the bounds size Y of the sprite renderer. And then on top of that, because the position is based on the center of the player instead of his feet, like in the original, I need to add half of the bounds of the sprite. Once I've set that start point, I want to instantiate him using that start point. Then I set the random seed to determine how the collectibles will spawn, and I use time.time. .time. I create the collectibles container to contain all the collectibles that will be spawned, and then I initiate the game state. Next is update. I update the mic label with the recorder's current volume. I don't need to do append calls because this isn't C strings. I can just use normal assignments and additions to add to the string. Changing the scene, I just called my change scene method I made. This game loop script is on the same game object as the global script, so I don't need to find the object. I just need to switch to the right script, and then I call the result scene when time is up because the player won. Here's the despawn collectibles. There's a lot less here because I do not need to set null pointers anymore. I also don't need to check for if the collection is handled because now that is handled by the collectible instead. You'll notice some things got moved into the respective classes because now I have multiple update functions that can handle it. But still here I have it handle whether the collectible went off screen. If it got away, I do that by getting the sprite wrecked and then its width. Divide that by 2, determine if it went off screen enough, and I put that into a vector 3 and get the world point equivalent and get the x value to determine if it went far enough. If it did, I destroy the item and I destroy the appropriate tile that's next in line. Down here, randomness is different. Rand.range, both values are inclusive, so that's why it's 0 to 99, so that I have 100 values to choose from. I'm checking 1% as I did in the original game. And if that condition's met, I spawn a new item. Spawning is the same as with the tile. I have to convert to world points from my original screen coordinates that I used in Cocos. And I base the positioning off screen based on the collectible prefab width. And then to determine the random height to start at, I included a parameter that the prefabs can use called start height in addition to points. 
and that's basically a percentage of the way up that the collectible will spawn. Speed, I reduced by a lot, as you can see, because to further make sure that the collectible doesn't push the player, I set the mass to a really small amount. So to compensate, I have to set the speed to a really small amount. Otherwise, the collectible would move super fast. I add a force to it to make it move. And then I store that new collectible into my container.